Good evening and welcome to uh, the Norwegian Unix User Group's uh, monthly uh, meeting uh, this year for uh, our December meeting. We managed to get uh, what I consider a famous author and uh, digital rights activist who's been with us for many, many years and has uh, been able to bump the world in slightly the right direction, sometimes at least. Uh, I first met him uh, at a FU camp, Friends of O'Reilly camp, uh, back in 2004, I think. And uh, none of the things me or him presented has been very famous, but the really, really big project started that evening was OpenStreetMap. Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, he has been written, he's been writing a lot of books, he's been doing a lot of events and basically inspired us all. So um, without further ado, I'll give the, the floor to Corey Doktorov. Thank you very much. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Uh, thank you to the folks in Norway who took the uh, did the work of translating my book, How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism. Uh, it's the, the short book that this talk is based on uh, into Norwegian. Um, obviously, I've, I've uh, had my uh, some time in Norway uh, working on uh, various projects with uh, Creative Commons Norway and NRK, and I've been lucky enough to have some of my work translated into Norwegian, albeit it was translated in Norsk, which I know everybody hates, <laughs> but apparently the Norwegian government uh, subsidizes that. Uh, the only person I've ever met who was like, oh, I'm so glad it's in Norsk was uh, uh, Broke P, Peter Sunda, who apparently his mother used to... Um, Tell them bedtime stories in Neunorsch. Uh, so, so the whole thing was uh, in, apparently just to make sure that one of the Pirate Bay guys could could read uh, Little Brother in, in Norwegian. Um, so I'm going to give a talk today. Let me get the screen sharing up here. I'm going to give a talk today uh, based on a talk I gave last week to McGill University. Um, let's see. Can I get that full screen? There we go. Uh, but when it's full screen, I can't see it. Well, that's terrible. Hang on. Uh, let me just see if there's a way to do a slideshow that isn't full screen. Nope. Let's just do it full screen then. All right. Um, so I can't see. So if I drift off my camera, someone has to shout at me because uh, I won't be able to see it. Um, and uh, also let me note that if you see me shifting awkwardly or making funny faces, I really injured my back yesterday. And so... Um, I have been spending most of the time lying on an ice pack, but I've managed to get myself upright with a shocking quantity of uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories for the duration of the talk before I go and stagger off and collapse again. So if I seem a little a little um, wincy, that's why. So this talk uh, I gave was in was part of a pair of talks. The other one was given by Shoshana Zuboff, and even if you haven't heard her name, you probably heard a phrase that she's that is attributed to her. She's at least one of the people who coined it, uh, surveillance capitalism. You may have seen this uh, Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma. Um, and uh, there is much I disagree with about the surveillance capitalism hypothesis. And that's mostly what we're going to talk about in this talk. But I want to start by talking about the part that I agree with, that um, big tech is controlling our lives and that it is bad. And it's bad because... Um, uh, we don't need a king because there is no such thing as a wise king. The world and our lives are better when we can exercise self-determination. That is, when we can find out about several options for our lives and choose the one that suits us best. Surveillance capitalism is the idea that companies control our lives through highly automated data mining tools that allow them to manipulate us for money. And that is where we part ways. I think that the companies control our lives not through manipulation, but through mind, or, or not through mind control, rather, but through monopoly. Uh, I just don't think that uh, companies can reliably turn the data they get by spying on us into a means of manipulating us. To the extent that you can manipulate us at all through data mining and through analysis, uh, the effects are short lived and very small. Uh, so, for example, the most celebrated example of uh, database manipulation that has peer review and formal publication is uh, Facebook, where they did a study, uh, I believe in 2011, or 2012, rather, where they um, uh, exposed 60 million Facebook users to messages encouraging them to vote. 
and observed that several hundred thousand of them, actually more than were anticipated, went out and voted. Now, several hundred thousand sounds like a big number. It is a big number, can sway some elections, because especially in the U.S., the elections tend to be very close. But the overall effect size was 0.4%. Um, and one of the things that we know about all stimulus is that we become inured to it over time. Um, I actually, before we started this talk, had to go and turn off the dryer that's here in my office, the clothes dryer, because I stopped hearing the hum of it. Uh, you stop... Uh, experiencing any stimulus over time, it, 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 it's the um, intensity of it diminishes. So even if you think a 0.4% nudge towards voting is a big deal, we don't know how persistent that effect would be. We don't know that if you exposed people to the same get out the vote message three, four, five, six, or seven times, that the uh, effect size would remain constant at 0.4% there's good reason to believe that it would fall. I mean, the very first banner ads enjoyed a click-through rate of in excess of 50%, and today they uh, get a tiny fraction of a hundredth of a percent uh, on, on average. So Facebook released the data on that voting experiment for a tactical reason. Uh, Facebook wanted to prove that it has a mind control ray that it could sell time on to advertisers. But that is obviously a self-serving claim. And it's thinly supported by data that was released by the company itself and was not uh, created by a third party that was neutral and didn't have a stake in proving that Facebook was really good at manipulating our behavior. Uh, now, even if we don't believe that Facebook has a mind control ray, we can still indict Facebook for performing non-consensual mass psychological experiments. Uh, and we can ask ourselves, is this a company that deserves to be in charge of the intimate, social, political, educational, civic, economic, and romantic lives of 2.6 billion people? And once you're asking yourself that question, it's a short hop to ask yourself whether anyone should have that power. Now, it's instructive to follow the trajectory of the belief in big tech's power to manipulate us. Now, it starts with big tech itself. Right. Companies making claims about how good they are at, uh, at manipulating our behavior as part of their marketing strategy. And some of the stuff that we see backstopping that marketing are things like patent claims. Now, if you know anything about software patents, you know that uh, patent claims are full of uh, uh, really reckless, unsupported claims that, that the patent office doesn't require you to prove that you can do something in order to patent it. And that companies typically make very, very broad claims in their patents in the hopes that a kind of uh, inattentive patent examiner will grant them patents to very, very broad uh, areas of activity. And then, you know, they, they start releasing this experimental data, spinning these experiments with 0.4% effect sizes uh, as proof that they really do have a mind control ray. Now, the next stage of the progress of this hypothesis uh, is big tech intermediaries. Uh, these are the advertising agencies and political consultants who, for money, will tell you how to use big tech to change people's minds. And again, they are not neutral in this fight, right? They um, have a vested interest in people believing that big tech is really good at manipulating you. Me. Next, I'm sorry? Your slides are... Uh stuck on the first page and we only see the LibreOffice. Uh, oh, well, that's not good. Slide. All right. Do you see this now? Yeah, I see the... Okay. Well, if I don't go full screen, it looks like that works. Uh, so, okay. Well, that's good. Then yeah. I can actually see my screen too. All right. Is that, is that okay? You guys won't be... Uh, don't peek at these thumbnails so that you can see what's coming next to you. You'll ruin the surprise. Just pretend this part isn't over here. All right. Uh, okay. <laughs> to me. Please go up. All right. Um, so, you know, the, these claims are taken up by the customers of the intermediary next, uh, advertisers and politicians. So you have companies that have bought the services of an intermediary who in turn bought the services of Facebook to convince you to buy their products. And they, of course, are invested in the product working, uh, particularly the individuals who make those calls. If you're the marketing officer who greenlit $100 million spend through your ad agency with Facebook, then you have a vested interest in telling people how great your ads work. Likewise, if you're a politician who wants to prove to other people in your party and donors that you're really plugged in and smart, you will go out and boast about how great you are at finding uh, uh, people to come and vote for you by hiring the best intermediaries who do the most savvy ad buying on the best mind control platforms. And then the final stage of this 
is the critics of the companies and their regulators who turn around and say, uh, for several years, we noticed you've been promising everyone that you have a mind control ray. And I know that that sounds great to you and your investors, but we're a little nervous about all of this. So, so here's how that um, evolution goes. Uh, you start with, um, uh, we can sell you anything. And then it turns into Google and Facebook invented a mind control ray to sell your kid fidget spinners. And then Robert Mercer stole it and made your uncle a racist. But these claims to mind control are self-serving. And the critics who repeat them are helping the tech industry sell it, its core product, the high-priced, unfalsifiable attempts to manipulate users. Remember, up until now, everyone who's ever claimed that they could manipulate public opinion reliably turned out to be a fraud. From uh, Rasputin to Mesmer to the sad people who buy neuro-linguistic programming books to the sociopaths at the CIA's MK Ultra program who secretly dose people with LSD in the hopes of brainwashing them and all they found out is that people have an unexpectedly uh, pleasant experience when they get LSD. And then finally, the misogynists of the pickup artist movement who, who believe that if they learn how to say just the right words, they can make the women that they hate have sex with them. Uh, and the only thing, uh, so th the thing about extraordinary claims is that they require extraordinary proof. And the only thing extraordinary about the claims that big tech has to being able to manipulate us is how extraordinarily thin those claims are supported in the evidence. Uh, you know, when you look at the underlying uh, scholarly basis for their claims, you see things like microexpression analysis. Well, independent analysis of microexpressions shows that people who've been trained to analyze microexpressions underperform a coin toss. Or sentiment analysis. Um, well, sentiment analysis has uh, not performed well in the field. Uh, despite having some of the very best backers. And for an example of, of how bad automated sentiment analysis is, think of the one that Jigsaw made. Now, Jigsaw is part of the Google empire, one of the Alphabet companies. Uh, they're, the, they're the company moonshot division that does improbable, amazing, ambitious things, supposedly. And they built a sentiment analysis tool that was supposed to be able to identify trolls uh, and block their comments or help moderators find their comments automatically. Now, to test these claims, a, uh, a journalist and cyber lawyer named Sarah Jiang, who's been subjected to a lot of racist and sexist uh, harassment online, decided to take some of the vicious comments that she'd received and ask Jigsaw whether or not it thought that these were trolling, whether or not it thought these were aggressive, harmful comments. So um, she gave it one comment to evaluate, and the comment that and the score that Jigsaw assigned it is 10, uh, 10 being perfectly inoffensive. And here is the comment that Jigsaw's automated sentiment analysis tool, the best of its breed, funded by the largest company doing work in the space. This is the comment that it thought was perfectly innocuous. I am going to rip out each one of her hairs and twist her tits clear off. That is the comment that uh, Jigsaw believed was just fine. That is the state of the art for sentiment analysis. Indeed, the whole idea of psychographics, including the big five personality types that Cambridge Analytica sold itself on, is, in the words of a literature review from Nature, uh, Nature uh, the journal, a scant science that has been most thoroughly developed <clears throat> through big tech's own sales claims to potential advertisers. Big tech's defenders and its detractors confronted with this are apt to counter that the, that the fact that ad tech makes billions in revenue means that it must work. But the fact that something pays for something is no proof that it works at all. I mean, think about uh, <clears throat> something that you might have in your own kitchen, multivitamins. Uh, multivitamins have been repeatedly shown in large careful meta-analyses to either have no effect or to be slightly harmful to the people who take them. And yet the multivitamin uh, industry is thriving. And it's not just multivitamins that are purchased by inattentive consumers at small dollar prices. Some of the most expensive things in our world that are bought by some of the most sophisticated buyers have been shown to also perform no better than randomness and sometimes worse. So think about hedge funds, hedge funds that get trillions of dollars from the world's most sophisticated investors and whose managers underperform index funds. Um, uh, and still, these funds get trillions of dollars from people who could make more money 
just by sticking uh, their their savings or their earnings into a low load Vanguard spread bet fund on the FTSE or the, the S&P 500. Um, hedge fund managers lose money often enough that those rich people could actually make more money a lot of the time just by putting all their savings in their mattress. At least then it wouldn't disappear down the drain. And yet most or, or maybe even all of these people, these hedge fund managers who are on seven figure salaries, believe that they are good at their job. The reasoning goes like this. If the smartest investors are give, willing to give me trillions of dollars to manage, uh, and, uh, to manage and then pay me millions of dollars to do it, I will definitely be able to convince myself that I am good at my job, irrespective of the actual objective performance uh, that I have in it when I do that job. Likewise, techies and their bosses, some of the highest paid people on earth, are, are convinced that they're good at bypassing our cognition to influence our behavior, and so do their customers. But in the absence of hard evidence, we should treat these guys as latter-day Rasputins, convinced that they can change our behavior, convinced that it's moral for them to do so, therefore some of the great villains of history, but likely deluded about what's really going on. So, what is really going on? Well, it's the same thing that's been going on since the Gilded Age. Monopolies. Even when you get big tech and its critics to agree that there's a problem with monopolies in the tech industry, they're apt to call these natural monopolies driven by network effects. But that's not what you see when you look at how the companies grew and came to dominate our world. So think about Google. Google is one of the biggest tech companies in the world, but its growth has been nearly entirely driven by acquisitions, not by network effects, and certainly not by uh, first mover advantage. Uh, Google is a company that has made one and a half very successful products. They made a really good search engine and a pretty good Hotmail clone. And everything else that they do in-house failed, right? Every product that they developed in-house no longer exists or is on its way out. Uh, you know, the Wi-Fi balloons are still lingering, but God knows how long they'll still be around in, uh, in years to come. Meanwhile, every successful product that they've had that wasn't Search or Gmail came from a company that they purchased. That includes their whole ad tech stack, uh, also YouTube and every other part of the, of the company like Android that gives it these so-called uh, network effect advantages. Um, now, even when you point this out, uh, the critics and the apologists for big tech will say, ah, oh, yes, but the, in addition to network effects and in addition to first mover advantage, they have great big data moats. They have enormous amounts of data that they can use to fend off competitors and outperform them. But there's rarely a good explanation for how data is supposed to do this. Uh, when, when you look at the, uh, the duration of these data sets, it's very hard to see how um, they can turn that into money. You know, if you know that I clicked on an ad 15 years ago, unless that ad was for a consumer good that wears out after 15 years, like maybe it's for a roof. You hold on to that data for another 10 years and now my roof is a quarter of a century old and you can advertise a roof to me. Um, that, then you can use your data to some advantage. Um, or, you know, if you have a lot of voice data, you can use it to tra train a voice recognition system. But the idea that this is the, the difference between the um, uh, capital assets of these companies and their valuation in the capital markets, the hundreds of billions of dollars that the market has valued them at in excess of their capital assets, uh, it just doesn't make any sense. That It's a very thin uh, thing to hang that, that hypothesis on. And a better one is that markets make bets on monopolies because they know that monopolies are profitable. Now, that doesn't mean that data isn't, isn't uh, scary. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be worried about the overcollection of our data. Indeed, we should be very worried about the overcollection of our data because um, all of that data is a form of compromise. It can be used to blackmail us, to harm us in many ways, to um, break into old accounts by answering password questions, um, and, and to uh, uh, um, subject us to state surveillance. Um, it can be leaked. It can be used to discriminate against us in uh, advertising financial products to us. Um, now, states, uh, when, when we talk about state surveillance and, and commercial surveillance, uh, the people on the commercial side, right, the Silicon Valley types, they say, well, I'm not worried about Google uh, abusing my privacy. Uh, all Google wants to do when it spies on me is show me better ads, and I'd like to see better ads, but I don't want the U.S. government 
to be uh, to be spying on me because those guys are sociopaths who weren't smart enough to get jobs in Silicon Valley. So I don't want them anywhere near my data. Meanwhile, when you go to places like um, the Naval Academy or the Air Force Academy, the Army Academy, where I've done talks, they'll say things like, well, you know, Uncle Sam, he has all of my data. I have to give everything to the government to get my security clearance. But those people down in Silicon Valley, they're just um, rapacious uh, uh, um, you know, profiteers, and they would sell their mother for a dime. I don't want them to have my data. But the reality is that the reason that um, companies are allowed to spy, the reason that governments exercise forbearance when companies want to spy on us, is that um, they for, they serve as an adjunct to the state surveillance capacity. You know, what we saw um, in the run up to 2013 when Snowden went public was that states were using warrants to secure data from the big tech companies and going in and asking them for data. And you, you may recall in the European Union, we had the data retention directive fight in the early 2000s, where uh, governments, instead of ordering companies not to collect data from us, in fact, ordered them to collect data and retain it for long periods so that it could be, uh, it could be hijacked into state law enforcement uh, and safety uh, uh, functions. Um, and then after 2013, when Snowden went public, we actually learned that in addition to going to the tech companies with warrants, they were also just spying on everything that the tech companies did. They put wiretaps between the tech companies' data centers so that they could see all of the data that flowed into the big tech silos. And then to hide the fact that they knew all of the data that was going in and out of the big tech silos, they would get warrants for the data that they'd seen and show up at big, te big tech's front door requesting the data that they had been getting through the back door. Um, the, the idea that the state is part, uh, or that private firms are part of the state's uh, data collection apparatus can be seen most sharply today through products like Ring. This is a surveillance doorbell that Amazon acquired through a predatory acquisition, and that has become part of uh, modern urban policing in the US. <clears throat> US police forces are, are given incentives, uh, merchandise, money, training, junkets, to go and market ring cameras to the people who live in the areas that they patrol. These cameras then form a, an off-the-books, warrantless video surveillance grid that cover whole neighborhoods without ever having to have a public consultation about um, whether or not uh, there should be CCTVs aimed at the street. Um, and that footage can be requisitioned through the front door by police by asking uh, the people who, who operate these cameras to let them see their footage, but also through the back door. So we've seen through Amazon leaks that if you go to someone and say, I'd like to spy on your surveillance doorbell, and they say no, that you can then turn around and go to Amazon, and Amazon will provide you with that footage that the owner of the doorbell didn't want. And so uh, there is no real distinction between private and public surveillance. It's a private-public partnership from hell. And uh, it's a really good example, not just of how the state and private actors combine to surveil us, but also how monopolies can subvert public policy. Because all of the surveillance does create real harms for us. And yet, because the industry is able to uh, offer itself to be deputized as an arm of the state, the state is reluctant to regulate it prudently and curb its worst impulses, the things that it does that bring harm to us uh, even though it doesn't bring much benefit to them. They, they're uh, creating massive harms for us uh, for very small benefits to them. Now, that's not to say that te tech does not have network effects. Tech definitely has network effects. But network effects are double-edged sword, thanks to something called interoperability. Interoperability, plainly uh, put, is when one thing works with another thing. Um, you can buy your socks from one place and your shoes from another, and they'll work just fine. You can buy a bottle of beer from one company and a beer glass from another company and put the beer in the beer glass. Uh, interoperability is woven really into the defaults of how we conduct ourselves in the public world. Um, but tech has another kind of interoperability, a kind of interoperability that is um, very exciting and often overlooked, and it's um, adversarial interoperability. That's interoperability when you plug one thing into another thing, even though the person who made the first thing doesn't want you to. Um, we also sometimes at the Electronic Frontier Foundation call adversarial interoperability uh, competitive compatibility. It's a little easier to say, and it abbreviates down to ComCom, -com, which is kind of fun to say. And um, we have uh, 
beloved and very important German staffers who find pronouncing adversarial interoperability as hard as English speakers find pronouncing uh, Fingerspitzengefühl and other long German words. And so competitive compatibility might be a little easier, especially for non-English speakers. And ComCom, this, this process of plugging one thing into another without asking permission, and in fact overriding the state of preferences of the people who made it, is lurking in the history of every one of the tech giants. So cast your mind back to the early 2000s with Apple. At the time, Apple was really suffering in the enterprise. You had all of these uh, giant companies that mostly had Windows machines. And you'd have a few Macs here and there. Maybe um, some of the creatives would have it. Maybe someone who just preferred the user interface and had enough clout in the company to demand that they be allowed to use a computer of their choosing would have a Mac on their desk. But the problem was that uh, the support for Microsoft Office on the Mac was really bad. Microsoft, who make Windows and Microsoft Office, had dragged its feet on compatibility between the Mac and Microsoft Office. They did have versions of the Mac, but those versions were so broken that if someone on the Windows side of the company sent a Word document to the graph designer and they opened and saved it in their Mac Word version, um, that file would largely be unreadable by everyone else in the world forever. Um, it was effectively a way to destroy Word files, not to read Word files. Now, Apple for many years had pursued a strategy of sort of asking Microsoft nicely to make a version of Word uh, that would work on the Mac, and that had failed. And rather than going back on bend and knee to Bill Gates, Steve Jobs just put an engineering team onto reverse engineering all of the Microsoft Office formats, and they produced the iWork suite, uh, Numbers, Pages, and Keynote, that could read and write all of the Office file formats without Microsoft's cooperation, and in fact, against Microsoft's wishes. And it saved Apple, and it created a, a, an ad campaign, you, you may have seen, the Switch campaign, about how easy it is to switch from using Windows to using a Mac, because all of those documents that lived out there in the Windows world were available on the Mac side now. Likewise, you have uh, Facebook in its early days. When, when Facebook started, Mark Zuckerberg had a really bad problem, which was that everybody who understood why you might want to use social media and everyone who loved social media was already using a, a rival product called MySpace that was owned by one of the world's most rapacious, vicious billionaires, uh, Rupert Murdoch, who does not like to play nice with his competitors, famously. So uh, Zuckerberg's problem was that although Facebook was an objectively better product than MySpace, it had a better user interface, it was easier to use, it had finer grained privacy controls. You may not remember this, but Facebook for its first decade sold itself as the pro-privacy alternative to MySpace. Um, the, the problem was that all of your friends were still on MySpace. And rather than trying to organize like uh, International Facebook Day, you know, on January the 18th, you and all of your friends close your MySpace accounts and open new accounts on Facebook, they made a little bot, a bot that would go to MySpace on your behalf with your username and password, get all the messages waiting for you on MySpace, put them in your Facebook inbox, let you reply to them on Facebook, and push them back out to MySpace. Um, this is part of the story of every single one of, of the tech companies, Microsoft, Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook. They have all relied on ComCom to grow. Um, but uh, Monopoly has allowed uh, all those companies that grew through adversarial interoperability to pull up the ladder behind them. Uh, as these companies grew to the point where they were the incumbents instead of the upstarts, they funded the expansion of patents, anti-circumvention, enforceable terms of service, and now uh, new anti-competitive hedges like the court uh, case that just went to the U.S. Supreme Court where Oracle is, is trying to make APIs copyrightable so that you won't be able to re-implement an API. And this is an example again of how monopolies distort public policy. It is clearly good for the world for people to be able to make new things that plug into old things. Um, and yet, we have emerged at a consensus on both sides of the Atlantic that that should be illegal. Now, um, pol public policy is important beyond just the realm of, of tech as we understand it. We live in a very, very technical world, and surviving, making it from one day to another in a very, very technical world requires getting the answer to very, very hard technical questions, questions that you or I cannot answer on our own. Um, you know, uh, is the 737 uh, Max safe to fly in again? Um, 
are the food safety guidelines for the food that's coming into your country or being sold in your grocery store sufficient? Or are you going to die from your dinner? Um, should you wear a mask? And if you and if so, how safe are you? Uh, is the uh, is the distance education that your kids are receiving pedagogically adequate, or are they being raised to be ignoramuses? These are not questions that you can answer, and they're not questions that I can answer. I mean, maybe you can answer one or two of them, right? You might be a cell biologist or an epidemiologist or virologist who can understand the question about masking. But are you a pedagogist? Can you answer the questions about your kids' education? And even if you can, can you audit the software of the Boeing 737 MAX to figure out whether or not they fix the code? Rather than answering these questions by telling people to do the research, we've historically answered them by having processes that even if the, the subject matter of the processes was too obscure for uh, the average person to understand, the shape of the process, the structure of the process was legible. You would have a, a group of expert regulators who were independent of all of the parochial interests at, at, uh, who were jousting to determine what the right answer would be to these hard technical questions. Um, experts who had different views of the truth would show up and present those views. Those views would be adjudicated by the neutral experts who would recuse themselves when they had conflicts of interest. They would publish their workings and their deliberations, and they would expose a process whereby you could challenge their findings on the basis of new evidence or on the basis of malfeasance or errors in their reasoning. And these processes have been discredited in every sector that has been monopolized because every sector that has been, not been monopolized has been able to distort the policy in its favor. So let me give you a brief rundown of some of the industries that have been monopolized in the last 40 years. Industries that have shrunk to one, two, three, maybe five or six companies, but often just one or two. Pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical insurance plans, pharmacies, the US health insurance market, the global appliance market, the global market in uh, athletic shoes, the US and global markets in defense contractors, the global market in commercial film production, the global market in cinemas and exhibitions, the global market in recording, uh, music recording, in publishing, in book selling, in stationery, in eyeglasses, LASIK surgery, enterprise software, car parts, glass bottles, which in the US have only one major manufacturer, car parts, uh, um, rental cars, hotels, aviation, rail, logistics, accounting, mattresses, oil, beer, spirits, champagne, cowboy boots, candy, even professional wrestling. All of those industries have shrunk to a handful of companies globally. And to understand what it means for a monopolist to be able to distort policy, policy let me give you one example from 2018. You may be familiar with the U.S. state of West Virginia, uh, particularly because, as we've talked about coal and coal mining during the Trump years, West Virginia was often uh, synonymous with the coal industry in the U.S. But actually, the coal industry is a relatively small part of what goes on in West Virginia. Its major industry is chemical processing. And because chemical processing is monopolized, that industry is dominated by one company, a company you may have heard of called Dow Chemicals, not a company with a sterling reputation. Well, Dow Chemicals and its industry association, which is to say just Dow Chemicals with a couple of other smaller companies uh, riding its coattails, went to the legislature in West Virginia. Now, West Virginia regulates the, uh, the, afflu the affluent from chemical processing by federal standards. The U.S. national government sets a limit on how much poison the chemical industry can put in people's drinking water. And that limit is based on one of these expert processes where different people with different ideas come together and, in, and a supposedly neutral expert makes a decision about how much is safe and how much is unsafe. And obviously this is a question of enormous moment and importance because if you get wrong, well then you'll poison people. Well, Dow wanted to get a, a statewide uh, exemption to this. They wanted to be able to pump more poison into the water in West Virginia that was pumped in nationally. And their submission to the regulator uh, laid out their basis for believing that it would be safe in, uh, in West Virginia to put more poison in people's drinking water than they, than they were allowed to put in the drinking water of people in other states. And, and that reason that they put before the regulator in their official filing was that in West Virginia, people are much fatter than they are in the rest of the country. And because they had more body mass, they could absorb more poison before they would be intoxicated by it. This is the kind of thing that you write in a box 
when the regulator says, just write something in the box and I'll give you what you want. And, and no one cares whether it makes any sense or it's true or plausible. There just needs to be something written there in the box. Now, there's an old fashioned word for what happened in West Virginia. We call it corruption. And corruption is another word for conspiracy, right? Uh, people think about this photo of Donald Trump meeting with all the tech leaders in 2017 around the boardroom table at the top of Trump Tower. And they're aghast because they say that all of these people are thought of as bastions of liberal thought. And here they are meeting with this kind of, um, uh, you know, comic straw man, uh, strong man um, thug. Uh, and, and isn't that shameful? And, and, you know, I'll admit that that was my first reaction, too. But then I looked a little closer and I said, well, wait a second. What does it say about us that everyone who runs the tech industry fit around one table? And isn't that far more alarming than, the, than who they're sitting with when they sit around that one table? Corruption is a synonym for conspiracy. And conspiracists are not lazy thinkers. You, you may have attended a seminar or heard a radio program about conspiracism in which uh, conspiracists were berated for a lack of critical thought. But um, uh, conspiracism is the opposite of a lack of, 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 of uh, critical thought. It's an overabundance of critical thought. Conspiracy is energetic, not lazy. If you want to believe in QAnon or that 5G will give you cancer or that you shouldn't get vaccinated, it's not easy. It's hard work. You have to first acquire an encyclopedic knowledge of actual conspiracies, moments in which industry gathered together to buy a policy that ended up harming people. Like, for example, in order to believe in anti-vax, it's very helpful if you know an awful lot about the opioid crisis in which a single family, the Seckler family, who got richer than the Rockefellers, had their family pharmaceutical company, Purdue Pharma, invent a new opioid called OxyContin, which they systematically misled the public about, such that um, people began to become addicted and die in droves. It ended up killing more Americans than the Vietnam War. Of course, it's been eclipsed by coronavirus, which is another version of the same story, where you have industries getting together and insisting that the truth is what's convenient for them, not what the public needs. So you have to be encyclopedic on these subjects. You have to understand why it is that the process by which we seek the truth uh, cannot be trusted. And from there, um, you are set adrift in an epistemological void, right? A, a world in which you cannot know what is true through a process, nor can you know what's true through individual expertise. Because again, even if you master the cell biology and epidemiology to speak knowledgeably about a virus, you're not an aviation safety expert and you, you, you can't know whether or not you can trust the Boeing 737 MAX. And without a process to trust, you have to find people, uh, people who sound like they know what they're talking about, personality cults. Modern conspiracies are at the intersection of the experience of real conspiracies, the trauma that results from those real conspiracies, and an easy process of learning about conspiracies and conspiracy theories, and for the ability of people who have conspiratorial beliefs to seek out others and recruit them to their conspiratorial discourse. Now, when we talk about conspiracism, we spend most of our time talking about this third factor, the stories about targeting and radicalization, but that is an incomplete focus. First, because it fails to ask a really important question. If targeting is tracking down people who can be swayed to conspiracies, why are there so many people who can be tracked down who are uh, in a position where they are vulnerable to conspiracies? Why are there more people who have been traumatized by real conspiracies, whether those conspiracies are offshoring or opioids? And second, we fail to ask uh, about the beneficial part of the so-called radicalization funnel that leads people who have uh, fringe beliefs to find other people who share those beliefs and to learn more together. The socially beneficial part of, of that process is that it allows people with socially disfavored views to find one another and make common cause. And sure, that's how we ended up with Nazis in Charlottesville or Anders Breivik murdering people in Norway. But it's also how we got the Black Lives Matter movement and the rising understanding that gender is not a binary. Because once you can search for people who have other disfavored views, you can find people who know the name 
for the thing that you felt all your life but could never put words to. And you can discover the community that you've been looking for all your life. Now, it's easy to understand why we'd, we would put most of our focus on the negatives of this, why we would be concerned with the bad belief that our neighbors have been absorbed into. But that is a purely reactive approach. It's been, it is more about firefighting than fire prevention. If we want to address ourselves to causes rather than effects, we need to understand the material circumstances that make conspiracism attractive to its adherents. That is, we have to address the corruption that makes institutions untrustworthy, the corruption that deprives us of a common epistemological framework for knowing what is true, the corruption that produces the trauma that sets people to seeking out alternate explanations for the frightening, brutal, mysterious material circumstances that they find themselves in, that corruption that we call monopolies. This is why it matters whether the problem is monopolies or mind control. If the problem is mind control, if the tech companies have created an immortal super weapon that strips us of our free will, then it would be catastrophic to break up those companies and distribute their mind cannons into more hands than we could ever hope to enumerate, regulate, or tame. But if it's monopoly, then we must shatter their concentrated power as a means of restoring good governance. Think of the mind control hypothesis as the idea that a comet is headed for the Earth. Breaking up that comet would just shower the planet's surface with a killing rain of meteors. The only recourse that we have, if that's the case, is to sear the comet. And the last thing that we would want in that circumstance is interoperability. That would just allow members of the public to try and sear the comet to their own needs. If it's a comet, then it is a fact of life, with us for eternity, there to be tamed if we can, but impossible to be rid of. And God help us if we lose control of that comet and it crashes into the earth anyways. But if it's a monopoly, then we know what to do. We just bust the trusts. Rather than looking to exotic explanations for market concentration like network effects, let's look at how we enforce monopoly law. After all, it's not network effects or first mover advantages or data that gave us one eyewear company, two beer companies, three record labels, four movie studios, and five publishers, which are about to be four because Simon & Schuster is about to be absorbed uh, into uh, Bertelsmann, which also owns Penguin. Now, it's not a mystery how we ended up in this circumstance. Forty years ago, a guy named Robert Bork, one of the great unsung villains of history, changed competition law. Robert Bork was a kind of court sorcerer for Ronald Reagan. He had started off, in, uh, or, or most uh, recently had been, the Solicitor General for Richard Nixon, uh, and his crimes under Nixon were so extreme that the Senate refused to confirm him for seat on the Supreme Court. But even without being on the Supreme Court, he managed to exercise enormous influence over global politics. Bork had an idea that the problem with monopoly was consumer harm, and that we should only fight monopolies or we could point to prices going up which harm us as consumers. Um, and now, it's nearly impossible to prove beyond a doubt that a course of action like a merger or uh, the fielding of a new product or another piece of anti-competitive conduct will cause prices to go up. So we basically, under Robert Bork, stopped blocking monopoly formation. And Robert Bork's idea spread to the European Union through neoliberal uh, leaders like Helmut Kohl, to the United Kingdom through Margaret Thatcher, to my own Canada through Brian Mulroney, uh, to uh, South America through Augusto Pinochet and other right-wing leaders um, who, who sees power there, uh, and it became the dominant way that we talk about monopolies in the world. So we have overwhelming evidence that mergers, acquisitions, and vertical monopolies will eventually raise prices, but we no longer enforce anti-monopoly law, even though Robert Bork told us that we should at least do it when prices might go up. The fundamental problem of consumer harm is right there in the name. It conceives of us as consumers, not as citizens. A consumer is an ambulatory wallet, not a member of a polity with a stake in the functioning of a society. A consumer can buy something or not buy it, but they can't demand better rules under which it is produced or sold or marketed. Monopolies are not bad because of consumer harms, but because of democratic harms. All that is not to say that tech monopolies don't deprive us of our free will. They do. Tech monopolies perform enormous, uh, breathtaking, persistent, large-scale acts of behavioral modification by locking our friends 
inside walled gardens so that if you want to talk to your friends, you have to go to Facebook every day. Not because you've been manipulated into it, but because there is no interoperability tool that lets you go to a new, better version of Facebook and still stay in touch with your friends the way that you could when you left MySpace for Facebook. They non-consensually siphon our data out of our devices. They prohibit us from installing the apps of our choosing unless those apps are approved by their, whoops, uh, unless those apps are approved by their central committees. They tell us what ink we can use in our printers. They tell us what parts we can use in our phones. They tell us which repair depots can fix our stuff. And when we have to throw that stuff out and buy new ones rather than fixing it, these are huge impositions on our free will and our self-determination. And while many of them depend on odious, irresponsible, and grossly harmful acts of surveillance, not all of them do. You may have heard the phrase that if you're not paying for the product, you're the product. But farmers who aren't allowed to fix their own John Deere tractors, they didn't get those tractors for free. And no one gave you a free iPhone in exchange for promising to only get it repaired at a genius bar. The thing that determines whether a company sees you as a product is whether they can get away with treating you like one. Whether the lack of competition and the metastasis of anti-competitive laws like software patents, anti-circumvention, and enforceable terms of service deprives you of the choice to punish them for mistreating you. Earlier, I suggested that the rise of conspiracism wasn't the result of ideology, but of material conditions. But, um, uh, but as I, uh, uh, it's, it's not that, um, I beg your pardon, it's not that conspiratorial arguments win, it's that our corrupt and material and terrifying material world loses the argument. But as I finish up this talk, I do want to say a few words about ideology, about things that people believe. Specifically, I want to ask what ideological factors make the surveillance capitalism hypothesis so robust, so spreadable. I think that the success of surveillance capitalism, the idea of surveillance capitalism, is the result of a strange ideological marriage between three groups of people who want to preserve the status quo for their own reason. The first is the tech industry, which is invested in its own status as a bunch of geniuses. If they are damned as evil geniuses, they'll take it because at least they get to remain geniuses. The next are the true believers in capitalism who practice a form of tech exceptionalism when they paint tech as the rogue capitalism, whose mind control rays short circuit the market's near mystical ability to self-correct. If tech is a rogue capitalism, then the problem is, capitalism, is tech and not capitalism. And finally, they're the people who are happy with the status quo if conspiratorialism is caused by a contagious mania that afflicts people of defective intellect, then we need to cure those people, not fix the system that is serving these believers well. And to those groups of people, I say, tech did not conquer the world through genius, but through the same mediocre sociopathy practiced by the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Bells, and other monsters of history. That markets tend to monopoly, and our minimum response should be muscular state intervention that prohibits anti-competitive mergers, restricts corporate power, and punishes anti-competitive conduct. We are never going back to brunch. The reason your neighbors went crazy is that the world is on fire and the system is rotten. They may believe crazy things, but they have an utterly sane reason to believe in them. Surveillance capitalism is not a rogue capitalism. It's just capitalism. It's not a comment. It's just three socio sociopaths in a trench coat. We've dealt with these jokers before, and it's high time we started dealing with them again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, during your talk, a few questions have popped by the pad, so I'll try to uh, yeah. start on the top and work my way down, see how far we get. Um, the first question, I don't really know if you're seeing the pad, but I'll just read it. Um, I can see it too. Go ahead. Big surveillance topic of the day is Corona contact tracing. Can you comment on this topic? Sure. Well, um, there, as far as I know, there is no automated coronavirus contact tracing. There's coronavirus automated exposure notification. And there's a really important difference here because exposure notification is quantitative and contact tracing is qualitative. Um, exposure, exposure notification tells you that two devices were in proximity to one another. Um, contact tracing gets the uh, what what the um, uh, uh, anthropologists call thick description. 
It involves getting a qualitative account of what happened when those two devices were next to one another. And that's why it's sometimes called shoe leather contact tracing. Now there's a, a thing that we practice in tech um, and that is uh, generally practiced in quantitative disciplines like economics and so on, which is the, the quantitative fallacy. And it's the belief that because qualitative elements are difficult to do math on, they can be safely discarded. It's like searching for your, lamp, your keys under the lamppost because it's too dark to look somewhere else. And so oftentimes when we're asked to consider a problem that has an irreducible qualitative element to it, like knowing whether the reason that these two devices were next to each other is because they were in an adjacent field automobiles in a highway traffic jam, or because they were two students who were attending an eyeball licking party at a university, um, we just discard the qualitative element. We incinerate it. And we take the residue that's left behind, this dubious quantitative residue, and we do math on it because we know how to do math on it. We don't know how to do math. We don't know how to quantize those qualitative elements with high enough fidelity. Um, and so, you know, this is actually endemic to uh, the, the tech platforms. I mean, you see it in, in Facebook and in Friendster and uh, all of the social media networks all the way back to six degrees, insisting that you define a relationship according to a, a fixed set of possible relationships, uh, although Facebook obviously introduced its uh, complicated one. But, you know, none of them have ever offered you the option of uh, not my friend, my boss, but if I said she was, wasn't my friend, she'd fire me. You have friend and not friend, but not, I have to pretend that she's my friend. Um, and, uh, and, and so you can see that at work in the way that we construct the social graph, and you can see it at work in the way that we construct these contact graphs, these exposure graphs. Now, contact tracing really, really works. And in fact, contact tracing, although it's labor intensive, um, has a, a strong history of working even in areas where the technology is very limited. So contact tracing, for example, is um, uh, credited with having resolved the, uh, the um, Ebola epidemics in uh, very, very poor and r rural and remote parts of Africa, uh, where there wasn't a lot of technological infrastructure, uh, but where people who were engaged in public health work were able to establish rapport. And, uh, and get information uh, that way and then build the maps that were needed to go out and find the people and help them make better choices about whether to isolate and, and um, uh, whom they should warn and so on. It's a, it's a very effective mechanism. But this quantitative element um, has two serious problems. The first is that's untried, right? We actually don't know if exposure and notification helps. Like a priori, it sure sounds like it should, but we don't know for sure whether it does. And, you know, we should find out. Uh, the second, though, is that there is a, a problem when you do exposure notification, uh, which is a problem that uh, contact tracing seeks to solve, which is the lack of a rapport between the exposure notification providers and the people who are required to carry exposure notification devices for it to work. So uh, I understand that in Norway, you had so, uh, such a low uptake of exposure notification apps that uh, because of worries about privacy, that the remaining data set was considered too fragmentary to be of use. Um, in Iceland, where they had a, a higher uptake of exposure notification, they, they, by their own reports, found that it was only of minor value to the contact tracing efforts. But I mean, the Norwegian instance is very interesting because you, you have this circumstance where um, the, the unwillingness of people to participate in the data collection meant that the data collection was too fragmentary to be of use. And you know that uh, uh, unwillingness, that uncertainty is not evenly divided. Um, it is concentrated among some of the highest risk people. So here in Southern California, where I live, we're not sure why it's so bad right now, but we know why it was so bad because it's very bad right now where we are. But we know why it was so bad in the early months of the virus. And it's because uh, uh, Southern California has a high number of precarious undocumented workers who don't get to complain when uh, their bosses um, put them in unsafe working conditions without adequate PPE. And as a result, we had a number of super spreading events in places where exploited workers were, had no agency 
and were forced to uh, work in unsafe conditions, which then caused it to spread uh, among wider populations. Uh, you know, the idea that you can have yeah. some people who are protected from the virus and some people aren't, who aren't is like saying, well, you can have a, a swimming pool where some people choose to piss and some people don't, and you can have the pissing end and the non-pissing end, and you just make up your mind, are you a piss in the swimming pool guy or not a piss in the swimming pool guy? Uh, except, you know, when it comes to these precarious workers, it's like we do that and then we lock the bathroom doors and, and charge a, uh, a euro to get in. Um, so uh, what those people are also the people who are least likely to want to participate in exposure notification because of the people who carry a legal risk. Likewise, people who um, see sex workers, uh, people who are part of disfavored religious minorities, um, sex workers themselves, people who are drug addicts, people who sell drugs to drug addicts, all these people are at high risk. They're all people who are likely to opt out of data collection, um, whether that's uh, if there is a, uh, an opt out that is sort of above ground where you just say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to carry the phone or install the app, or whether it's uh, they have to break the law to opt out, get a second burner phone that they carry when they go to buy drugs or engage in sex trade or, or, or other high risk activities. And those are the people that you really, really want to get data from because those people are at high risk and they're at high risk of spreading. And unless you have that, um, you, you're, you're not going to be able to use uh, this uh, exposure notification as an adjunct to your contact tracing. Um, and so, you know, some countries are very wealthy, uh, like Norway, which obviously has this giant sovereign wealth fund uh, from North Sea Oil that has been shrewdly invested and can afford a lot of public services. And maybe you don't have to choose, right? Maybe you've got enough money to pay for an army of contact tracers and to build out this experimental app on the hypothesis that it might help them do their work. But in other territories, particularly in U.S. states that uh, have not been offered financial aid by the federal government, um, it's often an either-or project. And so if we're going to uh, choose which thing we're going to spend money on, we have a proven thing, which is contact tracing. And we have an unproven thing, which is exposure notification. And as between those two, I think we should focus on the proven thing. This is not the time to be experimenting. You know, once a virus is over, let's use some of the data to evaluate whether or not in the future we should use these apps. But let's not, let's not uh, play games now. We have to choose one or the other. Right. So on to the next question, and uh, the questions are piling on. We'll see how far we get down the list. Um, the comments, but I skipped that one. Uh, to tie this to uh, into the coming war on general computation, do you see these data collecting monopolies acting to outlaw users' control of computers to increase their collection opportunities and reduce our ability? to move away from their services. Yeah, so I, I think that's the, uh, absolutely happening right now. Um, so to take an example, uh, the companies that everybody hates, printer companies. So HP uh, collects a, uh, now effectively locks you in to um, renting your ink. Uh, they collect a giant amount of data from you while you rent your ink. Um, and uh, there's no way to disconnect that ink renting printer from the internet. In, uh, without ceasing to function. And uh, what they've done is they've kind of moved up the stack from having a device that was not user controllable because they want to charge you extra money for ink, and now they have a device that's not user controllable because while they charge you extra money for ink, they also extract your data non-consensually and sell it to third parties. But it's, you know, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. Um, and I, I think that even the companies that are not surveilling us for commercial reasons, are, are using uh, software and hardware locks and the laws that back them up, like anti-circumvention laws, in order to maximize their profits. So famously, Apple does not spy on you to uh, monetize your data, right? They, they, they don't care about selling you a fidget spinner. Uh, but what they do want is to be able to access Chinese consumers and to be able to access Chinese manufacturing. And so uh, the Chinese government has a condition on Apple, which is that if they want to continue to access Chinese manufacturing facilities and cell phones to Chinese consumers, they have to remove all the working VPNs from the App Store so that the Chinese government can spy on people. 
Uh, and the Chinese government wants to spawn people because they want to figure out which Turkic uh, Muslims in Xinjiang they should put in concentration camps and who, uh, you know, what independent trade union activists are, are organizing wildcat strikes and so on. So they, they, they want to do it for their own reasons. They're only tangentially commercial, mostly about um, social control. And so I think that every one of these companies, uh, whether or not they're engaged in surveillance per se, has decided that felonizing things that displease their shareholders is good for business. That it's a, it, you know, in the same way that a lot of these companies just warehouse a lot of data without knowing what to do with it because the hard drives are cheap and someday in the future they might think of something cool. Um, a lot of these companies just want to be able to control your behavior because someday they might come up with a great way to make money off of you that only works if you can't opt out. And so once they can lock you in, once they can make you only use apps of their choosing and uh, or uh, only use parts or repair services of their choosing and so on, they can, uh, you know, turn that into money and neither you nor any of their competitors can unlock you. So, you know, Tim Cook gave a, uh, a speech to his shareholders or rather sent a letter to his shareholders uh, in early 2019 where he identified a serious problem for Apple, a serious business risk for Apple that um, the phones were lasting too long. People weren't replacing their phones and laptops as often as they used to, and it was, uh, it was drawing down Apple's revenue. Now, one of the things about having a, a monopoly over repair, which is a thing that Apple has repeatedly asserted that it should have, and it killed two dozen right to repair bills in US legislatures, um, is that it lets you decide what can't be repaired. It doesn't let, just let you charge extra for repairs. It lets you tell people that their stuff is beyond repair and sell you a new one. So I think that firms all have these parochial reasons to want to control general purpose computers, to want to have computers that take orders from them instead of from their uh, owners. Um, and, you know, whether that's automotive or, uh, um, or, or uh, you know, general purpose computing or kitchen appliances or med tech devices, uh, they all want this because it's a path to increase profitability. And to the extent that data is, is a way to make money, then they'll use, then they'll use it to extract data from you too. Right. It reminds me of a calculation I did last year on, um, regarding the cheapness of hard drives. I did a calculation on how much would it cost to record all phone calls in Norway. Right. And the number is surprisingly small. It's basically. 120 euro, 120,000 euros. Wow. Now I was going to say how many barrels of North Sea oil, but yeah, no, that's, that's a small number. That's a small um, number because people are calling less and less and sending messages instead and uh, hard drives are getting cheaper and cheaper. Yeah. Yep. That's right. I don't know if they are collecting it, but if, it, if they're not, it's not because of price. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I think this was one of the things that, um, people read about in respect to the NSA before the Snowden revelations was that there may be bulk collection of um, not just uh, not just clear text, right? Not just not just things that is legible to the NSA, but they might be warehousing cipher text, encrypted data, and just storing it against the day that someday there's a, a an error revealed in the encryption algorithm uh, that they can then go back in time and decrypt all that data. Uh, uh, you know, the, the one of EFS founders, a guy named John Gilmore, told me that he thought that it was probably the case that there that in certain neighborhoods all the GSM traffic was being stored uh, against the day that GSM encryption, uh, that flaws in GSM encryption were discovered and publicized. So then law enforcement could go back in time in a neighborhood where there, which was known for crime or drug dealing or whatever, and just unwind all of those conversations. Right. Yeah. Well, I think. Snowden information actually confirmed that they were able to go back and at least uh, decrypt some cases. SSL yeah, SSL. Yeah, they, they, they were. Well, so it's interesting because there was a, a second, you know, there's a second NSA leaker who we still don't know who that was. Um, and there was a bunch of stuff published in the German press two years after Snowden. Um, and one of the things were the uh, deep packet inspection rules for uh, long term retention. So what made someone a, a person of interest who was liable to this long-term retention where they would take everything that you posted and save it forever uh, or everything that you communicated, all, all the data that you, you emitted. And it was a fully automated process. Uh, and, you know, two of the things were uh, if you ever searched for tails, uh, installation instructions, or um, 
I don't think it was Signal. I think it was PGP. No, it was uh, Tor. Tails or Tor. If you ever search for Tails or Tor, you went into long-term retention. Uh, and so they just, so they don't indiscriminately store it all, but that's pretty close to indiscriminate, that targeted surveillance. Yeah. So I'm, I'm on the list. Definitely, I've been searching for both and more. Anyway, go back to the list of questions. The next one was, um, what about Orkut, the Google version of Facebook? In the start of all of them, it was the invite only, make them more desirable. Yeah, I mean, they all have their own little um, uh, growth strategies uh, that, you know, may have been prescient or may have been lucky. I mean, there were lots of social networks. Not all of them were invite only to start with. It may have been that the invite only ones kind of won it. Like we've got survivor bias, right? Because the ones that were successful found that the way you bootstrap uh, a social network, at least in the early days when social networks weren't um, well understood, right? Because recall that that bringing in new users to Facebook uh, today does not require that you explain to people what Facebook is, right? Whereas in the early days of Facebook, the majority of potential Facebook users, which is everyone who wasn't already a MySpace user, didn't know what social media was. And then there was this minority of low-hanging fruit, which was the people who were already using MySpace, who didn't know what social media was and why they'd want it. So it might have been that the, that invitation strategy uh, drove um, uptake in the early years. It doesn't seem like that's a strategy that works now. Um, that the the now that you have a saturated understanding of social media, uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. At least in Norway, there is a uh, one social network that. Uh proponents are very proud that they are invitation only because they don't get the riffraff and kind of get decent dis discussions according to a friend of mine who is on this network. Uh, so sure. apparently it yeah. still works in some areas. But they don't grow. I mean, there are tons of those. And, and I think that like, you know, you could, you could easily imagine um, in a world of adversarial interoperability or, or interoperability mandates or some combination that there would be gateways between those and people who are on other services that you could federate with according to rules of your own devising. You see bits of that in things like Mastodon, where, you know, I, I last week I, I blocked um, a whole Mastodon server, not just not just a Mastodon user, because I went and looked at a, they had a super offensive server name. And I went and looked, and it was it was a bunch of horrible people who had kind of self-identified as horrible people. And I could defederate just my feed from them without... Right. Um, uh, requiring that the administrator of my Mastodon server defederate from their Mastodon server. That's nice to have that kind of control over your feed. Mm -hmm. That well, that kind of self determination, right? That that you know you, you don't have to. You can build community that is as porous as makes sense for you, without having to um, convince other people that they should want the same thing that you do. You, you can each of you inhabit your own uh, customized environments that reflect your individual peccadillos, your individual uh, um, desires, your individual needs and idiosyncrasies. Yeah. So next one, uh, for follow up the Orchid question is what about parlor.com? Oh, parlor with an E, it's spelled wrong, P-A-R-L-E-R. -E uh, I mean, you know, the the this is the right wing alternative to Twitter, uh, and um, you know, it's a, it's easy to dunk on them, <laughs> and hard hard not to dunk on them. But you know, it was founded by people who are angry at Twitter's moderation policies, and you know what? I don't like Twitter's moderation policies. I think they under moderate things that they should do more of, and I think they over moderate things that they should do less of. Um, I I think though that the idea that you solve this by having a place with no moderation policies uh, has been proved to be wrong by Parler itself, which is a very aggressive moderator uh, and kicks people off all the time, particularly people who complain about Parler moderation, which is, you know, the, the um, it's the trap of every moderated forum. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the fallacy of Parler is that uh, Jack Dorsey uh, is the wrong person to be in charge of the social lives of a couple hundred million people, which I think is true, but that somewhere out there is the right person to be in charge of the social lives of a couple hundred million people. And that's clearly not true. Um, I, I I think that, uh, you know, like leaving aside the fact that I that the, the 
ideological bent of the people who founded Parler is very different from my own. I, I think that it's very instructive to watch them reinvent all of the reasons that Twitter uh, moderates badly. So for example, Twitter is very, um, and, and all the other big platforms are very reluctant to tell you what the moderation rules are, right? They say, well, you can't engage in this kind of speech or that kind of harmful speech or whatever disinformation, but they don't define what disinformation is. They never define what harassment is. the system, yeah. Yeah, well, that's right. Because like, imagine that you define harassment as, you know, being a certain set of behaviors. The thing that is almost those behaviors, but not quite, yeah. is indistinguishable subjectively for the person on the receiving end of it from those behaviors themselves, right? And so if you tell people what the behaviors are, then they can um, effectively become dice lawyers, right? They can become uh, rules lawyers who uh, are able to argue that they have not stepped over the threshold. And moreover, they can tempt their adversarial opponents, their, their ideological opponents, over the edge. So you see this with um, uh, the Sen regime in uh, Cambodia, where you know the dictator of Cambodia nearly lost an election to a Facebook organized opposition in 2013. And he, he um, solved his problem by organizing uh, Facebook experts who work for the government. And so they have their own hyperpartisan news outlet on Facebook. They make sure that nothing on that falls uh, uh, on the other side of the Facebook policies. They know who all the people in Cambodia are. So they can tell if someone who claims to be in Cambodia is using a fake name. And if they are, they get Facebook to kick them off the service for violating the real names policy. And if they aren't, the police go over and arrest them. Uh, and then for people who are outside of Cambodia, the Cambodian diaspora and the exiles of Cambodia, who uh, don't like this dictator, um, when, when they speak elsewhere, um, the sort of cyber militia, the state cyber militia of Cambodia, tempts them into saying things that cross the line with what without actually crossing the line themselves and as soon as they cross the line they get them kicked out so the whole domestic opposition has been neutralized and the whole foreign opposition the whole international opposition has been uh um uh, neutralized by mastering moderation policies and so you see this on parlor really quickly right you you see parlor having to like refuse to tell you what parlor policies are that will get you kicked off uh, and instead having sort of broad discretionary policies that then, as parlor scales up, are being uh, exercised with discretion by individuals who have different ideas about what constitutes uh, good judgment. And so you have inconsistency. And then that inconsistency is magnified by privilege, because if you know the parlor team and you don't like a moderator's choice, you can probably get them overruled. But if you're just a pleb, you get kicked off the surface. And so parlor is just re recreating, recapitulating the entire process that gave rise to the Twitter mess. You know, there's a different approach to rulemaking than the American rulemaking, which as far as I can tell, had to be very detailed and verbose. Uh, you can have more simpler and easier rules. I don't know if you know the Norwegian card, the Mummerloven, which I don't translate there. Uh, you shouldn't bother others. You have to be nice and kind and Mm -hmm. <clears throat> for all other purposes, you can do whatever you want. Uh, that's one way of making rules, making a general statement instead of trying to cover all the cases. So, like the Norwegian um, uh, driving traffic, traffic law, I think you should call it. Uh, most people breaking the law in the traffic are taken down by one simple rule be nice to others and be careful and don't mess up. Mess up. Uh, rule number three in the traffic law. Uh, so you don't always have to be very detailed to get a, a sensible rule, I think. But it, it requires good faith, right? Because yes, you could argue that the reason you did something was not because you were being mean, but because you were, uh, you know, you, you, you thought that it was the right thing to do, you were acting in good faith and so on. Um, and you know, so you need a social contract ahead, ahead of it. And social contracts are really important. I would never argue that you can fully replace a social contract with a set of rules. And, you know, this is a thing that, that was became a cliche during the Trump years that 
Uh, a lot of what we thought were rules were actually norms and that the norms could be violated very quickly and that, that, you know, once someone was willing to defect from the social contract, it happens really fast. And Norway, you know, is a country whose social contract has been very robust, but not what it hasn't been. And it's not just Breivik, right? It's, it, I remember the being in Norway at the literature who's at in Oslo uh, and talking about how much I enjoyed reading Newt Thompson in translation, who I thought of as a groovy leftist writer. And they're oh. like, oh, no, we don't, we don't talk about Thompson here. Uh, and, and, you know, it, like Norwegians are not immune to defection yeah. from the social consensus. And Absolutely. so, you know, there are, there are people who are, you know, not full Humpson or full Breivik, but, but, you know, acting in bad faith in Norway too. And, uh, you know, if there's, if there's one thing I've learned from watching Scandinavian television, it's that uh, there are plenty of murders. <laughs> And so, um, you know, that uh, that are that are committed by like with incredible skullduggery that detectives need to solve. So uh, I, I, um, you know, the social contract gets you so far, but you need a mix of a social contract, and then you need a thing to do when the social contract fails. You need a a, a set of rules too. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, there are different approaches to it. Was just my point. So. Yeah. Anyway, back to the question list. There was one on. Um... Uh, some countries in Asia, like the Philippines, you get Facebook Messenger for free with your prepaid card. It's not mm -hmm. deducted from your data plan. What's your take on this? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's nakedly anti-competitive to begin with, right? Like, there are also problems. I don't like Facebook, but it wouldn't even matter if it wasn't Facebook. It wouldn't matter if it was Apple. It wouldn't matter if it was Google. It wouldn't matter if it was Tencent. Um, it's nakedly anti-competitive because it means that Third parties who want to enter the market start at a disadvantage because uh, the service is, is free uh, for Facebook user for for with your mobile connection, and so they just squeeze out the competitors. So you know, an example here would be uh, in the U.S. Um, we very unwisely allowed one of the companies in my neighborhood, Time Warner, uh, to buy AT&T, one of the big carriers. Uh, and so now AT&T owns HBO, which is one of the big media companies. And they've announced that for 2021, they're going to put uh, all of the first-run movies on HBO. And so if you are a Time Warner customer, you get HBO at a discount. So if you get your internet from, or if you're an AT&T customer, you get HBO at a discount. And then it doesn't count against your data cap. And so you have cap data. Uh, for say Disney Plus, which is another one of the businesses in my neighborhood, I live within walking distance of Disney Universal and Warner, so it it all plays out literally on the streets around my house here in Burbank. Um, and, uh, and so, if you're Disney, you've got Disney Plus. It costs six dollars a month, and it counts against your data cap. But if you're HBO, you've got, or if you're your AT and T, you've got HBO is free, and the movies are, uh, and and the movies don't count against your data cap. So um, if over time you can see how that's going to make it impossible for Disney to compete, but even more so, imagine trying to found Netflix today, where you have Disney with a giant catalog charging six bucks a month. You've got HBO tied up with AT and T. You've got NBC tied up with Comcast, and you're trying to start just to streaming only with no studio affiliation, and without without a carrier affiliation, there's no way you could enter the market, and so. It's a way of ensuring that the reason your company does well is not because it has the products that people prefer, but because it's impossible to compete with it. And, you know, I'm not a true believer in markets as the thing that can solve all of our problems. But the one thing markets are supposed to do is to reach into the world and find the thing that people like and give you more of it. And this doesn't give you more of it. This just gives you, this takes the person who has made the most money, who has access, most access to capital markets and allows them to dominate the, uh, the market. But would you feel, feel the same way if, for example, uh, Starlink uh, decided to give you Wikipedia with no data cost? There's, a, there's actually some independent research that Mozilla did on this because there's zero rating plans in Africa uh that facebook ran with its uh internet i think it's called internet zero is the program yeah. um where they included wikipedia and what they found was that the primary benefit for it was to um was to uh middle class and upper class internet users uh who just would um they would access the whole web 
on their Wi-Fi when they were at home, and then they would access the free web when they were like on the train on their way to work. Uh, and then they'd get to the office and they would have the whole web again. The 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 pro the, the thing is that using Wikipedia as part of the zero rating and Wikipedia pulled out uh, of the zero rating schemes and, and using Wikipedia as the zero rating scheme is just it's like greenwashing. It's like it's like saying you're gonna plant trees with some of your oil money. Like it's a thing we shouldn't have. We should have a level playing field, not a, a, a tilted playing field where you do a carbon offset by putting Wikipedia in it. Right. So next question. Which one? Do -do -do. Now, did you watch the hearing that Congress had in the U.S. with Apple, uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc.? Uh, what's mm -hmm. your take on discussions in Congress? Uh, yeah, and then there's this other question about Tencent, whether they're any yeah. better, the Chinese companies and 5G and the national champions and so on, Ericsson and Nokia. Um, so uh, the um, this idea of national champions, right? This idea that uh, the Chinese companies uh, are a danger to the West and that we have to defend ourselves against them by uh, exercising forbearance in respect of the American companies, allowing them to be big monopolists. Actually, this, this just happened. Nick Clegg, you know, the former deputy prime minister of the UK, who's now making millions of pounds a year to shill for Facebook, uh, just, just sent some stuff around where he said, um, you know, China is going to take over the world. We have to abandon our obsession with breaking up big tech so that we can fight the, you know, the, the menace from the East. Um, and, and you know this is a thing we've heard in other contexts historically in the world, um, and most notably, in 1982, the last act of effective antitrust in U.S. history was breaking up AT&T, uh, and then you know they basically dismantled antitrust after that, and so AT&T was able to reform. But in the run-up to the breakup of AT&T, people warned that there was an Asian power full of copycats that was, uh, that had, was run by um, uh, you know, fascist autocrats uh, who would destroy the American tech and electronics industry unless we kept AT&T intact as our national champion. And that country was Japan. <laughs> and um, it turns out that the thing that AT&T was most engaged with in 1982, its biggest regulatory project that it pursued with its monopoly power was keeping people from using modems and, and, build, and preventing the growth of the internet. And getting that U.S. tech industry out from under AT&T was the, created the U.S. tech industry as we know it, right? I mean, that's, that's how we got this explosion of U.S. soft power around the world. And it's not just AT&T, you know, the, 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 uh, like the death rattle of the U.S. Um, well, let me let me go back a bit. So when AT&T uh, was broken up, the U.S. Department of Justice was in the middle of two giant antitrust suits, both of which have been going for more than a decade. One was the AT&T suit, and the other one was IBM. IBM had been under antitrust uh, investigation for 12 years. Every year for those 12 years, it had spent more on its own lawyers than the entire U.S. government antitrust division was spending on their lawyers for all antitrust cases. Uh, it had been dragged up and down, you know, uh, uh, several kilometers of gravel road by its ankles by the DOJ for more than a decade. And the DOJ walked away from that lawsuit in 1982. In 1984, IBM brought out the IBM PC. And they decided not to prosecute Phoenix computers for cloning its ROM chips. And more importantly, they decided that they wouldn't um, uh, try to develop their own operating system. Because one of the things that the DOJ had been very interested in was how IBM had created vertical monopolies where they controlled both the software and the hardware. And so they went out and they found a couple of hobbyists in Seattle, Bill Gates and Paul Allen. And they asked them to procure an operating system for them. So they went out and they bought CPM from its authors, renamed it DOS, and sold it to IBM. Yeah. So antitrust gave us Microsoft, right, which is another source of enormous American soft power around the world. Now, by the mid-90s, antitrust was almost dead. But uh, it had a little life left in it. And it went after Microsoft, after, the, after Microsoft destroyed Netscape with anti-competitive conduct. 
And for seven years, it chased Microsoft up and down and around the country, never managed to break it up. But the experience was so traumatic that when a couple of Stanford grad students, uh, Sergey Brin and, and Larry, started a little company called Google, Microsoft decided not to do to them what they had done to Netscape. And so that was the third wave of the US tech, tech industry and the third wave of US soft power around the world. And so if the US wants to remain competitive against China in the coming decades, all the evidence suggests that we should do to Google the thing that we did to Microsoft that allowed Google to come into existence, that we did to IBM that allowed Microsoft to come into existence, right? That the, the history of um, preventing our national champions from monopolizing our industry is that we unlock the industry not that we uh, not that we weaken it. I mean, you know, you can look to contrast uh, to Ericsson and Nokia, uh, which you know, Ericsson is is um, is it still part of Sony. I think it is, right? I'm not sure who's owning it. But, uh, I think it got absorbed. Not... I don't know if they spun it out again. But Ericsson, you yeah. know, is is basically someone else's R and D division. Yeah. And Nokia is a. Uh, a, a rump of Microsoft these days. And, you know, I remember when Nokia was a big deal. I met my wife at a Nokia event in Helsinki at Midsummer's. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that was organized by Marco Adesari yeah. uh, uh, 17 years ago. So I remember when Nokia was a big deal and could fly people from San Francisco to, to Finland for matchmaking events with British uh, uh, tech uh, people. <laughs> Uh, that is not the case anymore. Nokia is, is, uh, was protected by its government, um, and it was able to do anti-competitive stuff to potential firms that popped up in the country, and it basically vanished. So I don't think there's much evidence that protecting a national champion will uh, defend the U.S. against Chinese hegemony. Yeah, I agree. I think part of the thing that makes humans so successful is our diversity. That People yeah. come up with crazy ideas and follow through, and some of them actually succeed and makes something useful. And so, if we um, had central control, we wouldn't have that kind of. That's capacity. right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I have to go. Uh, okay. I, I'm. We're we're at the two hour mark, uh, or one and a half hour mark. Um, I really appreciate it. There's. It looks like there's some really good questions in the chat. I'm sorry I didn't get to them. Yeah. Thank well, you very much for this. Thank you very uh, much was... for having taken your time for to do this. And yeah. I really look forward was... to having the book out in Norwegian. I'm yeah. proofreading it's not uh, North, every day. It? We had hoped to have it North, ready North, for North. today, but uh, oh, good. too much work but you, left. It's, you didn't translate it into Norsk, did you? No, it's Bokmål, yes. Uh, oh, very good. <laughs> I'm not very good with Norsk, so that would be... It wouldn't be done this week if I was okay. going to in Norsk. Excellent. Well, Peter Sunda will be uh, will be disappointed, but I'm I'm glad to hear it. He well, can thanks, join everyone. me. No problem. I'm happy to take new North translators. Thank you Excellent. very much for okay. taking your time. Talk and to you later. Very nice to see you. See you again later. All I right. hope. Bye. Bye.